I can hear. I think we're good. We're All good. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Good. All right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, continuing on, we're, the church is is um, basically a, a direct historical a continuity with the ancient church, with no uh, compromising of our beliefs and way of life. And this pur purposeful commitment to preserve tradition, we neither add nor take away anything from the tradition as passed down by, from the apostles. And that's what creates what we call the unity of faith present in our church at this time. Two features make this possible. One, we possess a unique, uniquely orthodox phronym on our mindset. And we recognize the presence or lack of that in other uh, Christians, uh, particularly Roman Catholics or Protestants. And ours, as we've talked about uh, a few sessions back, they have a different way of thinking and looking at Christianity. Those who have an Orthodox pronoun I reject the behavior, writings, and statements, and ideas of laity, clergy, and theologians who manifestly lack an Orthodox mindset or spirit, even if they bear the name Orthodox. Without an Orthodox pronoun, one cannot truly express Orthodox Christianity. And I think what the author is referring to here is oftentimes on the internet, people will see things that say they are orthodox in origin, but um, often they're not. And they sometimes pass on some misleading uh, information. And it, it's very confusing uh, for people who are looking for orthodox Christianity or even orthodox who are uh, trying to learn more as we are uh, and then they go to the internet and they see things that aren't necessar necessarily uh, in line with what she's talking about, the orthodox mindset. You know that statement, too, um, when you think about, like, our kids, or, my, or myself, too, coming in, you know, from a Protestant religion and then getting married. And then people say, well, it's just this kind of the way we do it. This is, we've done it all this time. And. Um, you either grasp that and you accept it, or it's like you're struggling trying to figure out what this is all about. You right. know, I think for this, the marriages that are mixed marriages, like Beth and myself, and so many marriages now, it, it is tough coming from the outside. And it's not so much that the religion Protestant is bad or Roman Catholic is bad. It it's just doesn't have the fullness of the faith of the Orthodox Church. Exactly, Robin, and, and, and she'll address it here a little bit later. A lot of times non-Orthodox have to unlearn a lot of uh, Western ways of thinking about Christianity in order to pick up the Orthodox mindset. And so it, it, it's a challenge sometimes. And so a strong and unified Orthodox mindset uh, involves actively practicing the faith and then that promotes, protects, and supports our unity of faith with all our brothers and sisters. And again, this is not automatic. It doesn't happen by itself uh, just because you're a member of the church uh, or because somebody intellectually agrees with the Orthodox uh, tenets that we have. So it's something you have to live. You have to live the faith uh, in order to uh, pick up the Orthodox mindset. We are one church. When people think about the Orthodox Church, they think, well, there's Orthodox churches, there's Greek Orthodox, Antiochian, Russian, et cetera, et cetera. But we are one church. And she goes on to say that in terms of governance, Orthodoxy includes many jurisdictions. The church consists of many self-governing or autocephalous churches throughout the world. At times, these squabble among themselves. And boy, do they. Uh, and and you know, they have some where they're, you know, they're actually in active, you know, non-communication with each other. Uh, and, and unfortunately, this happens. It's happening, uh, unfortunately, in our own time, with, particularly with the Ukrainian situation. Where, uh, there's a lot of, um, I would say, excommunication, not excommunication, but in non-communion with each other. And this is very unfortunate, but, you know, <clears throat> God willing, these things will resolve. Um, you know, in a, in a brotherly manner. However, and she goes on to say, in terms of faith, there's only one church 
and the unity of the faith among the Orthodox is quite strong. So we still believe the same things, even though one group may not uh, agree as far as the hierarchs with each other. So, but we still believe the same things. So the Orthodox are united by a common faith practice and fromina, uh, rather than a centralized authority. So unlike the, the Roman church, particularly, uh, it's not everything is in the hands of Rome and the Pope. Uh, we have a unity of faith among all these autocephalous churches. So acquiring an Orthodox Roma is a tremendous challenge for converts, as you were alluding to, Rob. Uh, those who are born into the faith and are steeped in Orthodoxy from the beginning uh, ordinarily don't face the challenge of unlearning Western theological paradigms, explanation, thought patterns, and assumptions. And uh, again, often our, our, our Protestant and Roman Catholic brothers and sisters will say, <clears throat> well, we have a doctrine about this. What's the Orthodox um, you know, definition on that? Mm -hmm. And we really don't have that, that kind of uh, set definitions of every single thing, or how do you interpret this passage in the Bible, et cetera. So a lot of uh, the things that are brought into uh, with converts, they have to unlearn some of that. And even among uh, Orthodox Christians, your author says, uh, living in the West, we get influenced by our culture, by our secular education, to an extent that uh, many cradle Orthodox clergy, faithful, and theologians are influenced by Western phronema, often without realizing. And you know, all of us in this room have probably uh, lived in the Western culture where we start to pick up some of these things, even if it's in our secular education, but a lot of this way of thinking uh, seeps into our, our mindset. So there's like questions, why don't we change this? Or why, why do we have, like again and again, you know, we say the prayer and, and they do it. So why don't they just cut it out? And right. Just do it like once or instead of two or three times. But, um, you know, so you hear that chatter a lot. Yes. And not so much about priests, but I mean, amongst us. Yeah, the laity. And, and even I myself questioned it at some point until I learned and realized that those small litanies are actually what we call connectors between the antiphons. And so we have the great litany, and then we have an antiphon, and then we have a small litany, and then the second antiphon, et cetera, et cetera. And what those were, there are links in a chain that, that link the prayers that progress through what we call the um, the uh, uh, liturgy of the, of the catechism, or the mm -hmm. liturgy of the word. And so once you understand that, then you say, oh, I see. Now, this is why we say again right. and again, because we're linking now that first. Now, going back, I don't want to get too far off here, but in the uh, Russian Orthodox tradition, the first antiphon is actually one of the uh, psalms. Uh, I can't remember which one it is exactly, but we don't we don't say the psalm in the Greek and the Antiochian tradition. We just say through the intercessions of Theotokos, and then the second one is yeah. O oh, Savior, save us. Save us. It's and bless so, it's bless the Lord, O oh my soul. We used to do that a long time ago. Oh, okay. Thank you, Donna. And that's I, yeah, I couldn't remember which one, but that's it. And so those uh, small differences in our traditions uh, still, we still had the same um, belief, I would say. In fact, I did read that uh, through the intercessions of Theotokos, it's sort of a compression of that first Psalm, bless the Lord, O my soul. And then the same thing with the second um, Psalm. And then the third uh, antiphon is actually the Beatitudes which again, we don't sing, but the Russian tradition does. Mm. So uh, all of these things, uh, you know, are, are differences, the comments and questions of those people who have picked up this Western uh, phronema, uh, oftentimes they're revealed in some of the things they uh, write and conclude. But uh, anyway, we avoid definitions as, as we've talked about before. 
Occasionally, a question is posed that begins, well, what's the official teaching of the Orthodox Church about mm -hmm. X? And I've even heard people say, well, why can't the Orthodox Church say something about abortion or, or uh, marriage or et cetera? And we often really don't because unless the answer can be given from the ecumenical councils or the Nicene Creed, a reply is impossible because the question itself presumes a Western uh, mindset that we really don't have. So the, the church can say ethically, we've always believed that life begins at conception and therefore uh, <clears throat> abortion is not ethically uh, allowed in the Orthodox Church. But beyond that, we normally don't make a lot of statements concerning particularly secular issues. Uh, a question about official orthodoxy does not reflect our mindset, neither the way we think, theologize, or operate as a church. The Nicene Creed is definitely an official statement of faith. It came about because of so many uh, heresies that occurred in the early church that the church fathers had to sit down and say, no, this is what happens. Our, uh, the father is the, uh, you know, unoriginate, the son, and we, and they, we describe the son in detail because he appeared here on earth and we know about him. And what about the Holy Spirit? Well, he's one of the Trinity. He spoke through the prophets and, and that's about it. He's the giver of life. And that's what we know about him. So that's that's so. Other than the the, the creed and the canons uh, and the and that seven ecumenical councils, those are the what I would say the official documents that we rely on. Uh, we also use ancient sources. The church uh, fathers are cited almost exclusively to analyze or discuss the question in our church. A theologian will turn to the ancient sources, which are scriptural, patristic, and canonical, and then they cite those. And so you'll see, I usually cite almost all the time uh, church fathers because I'm using sources like uh, Dr. Constantino, who uses church fathers and back and back and back, back to the apostles, essentially, and scripture. Uh, we don't offer exact definitions. As we said, the church has always preferred what we call apophatic theology, which is expressing what God is not, since he is beyond description. So we'll often <laughs> talk about what God isn't rather than <clears throat> defining what he is. For example, God cannot be seen, so he's invisible. He can't be comprehended, so he's incomprehensible. God is not only beyond human words, he's beyond even human understanding, but, and this is what I, I want to drive home, he loves us, he was, we were made in his image and likeness, he wants a relationship with us, so as a concession to our humanity, he condescends to our weakness by allowing himself to be discussed and described using human language. Since God is beyond all human understanding, we prefer the language of negation. And so it's not that he's way out there and we can't connect with him, quite the opposite. He wants to have a relationship with us. And so he condescends to allow himself to be uh, described in, quote, human terms. But, and in fact, he became human in order to relate to us and bring us back into a relationship with him. Now, as an example of this, the first prayer of the Anaphana, or an offer. We won't hear this because it's said silently by the priest, but I want you to be aware of it because it's actually this negative or negation that the apophatic language is in our liturgy. And, and what it occurs is uh, right before the anaphora where the priest comes out and he says, let us lift up our hearts, we lift up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord, what the priest says which he's basically saying, let us start the Eucharist. The choir then goes into, it is meet and right to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. While that uh, hymn is being sung, the priest is saying this prayer. 
And this is just the first part of it. It is meet and right to him thee, to bless thee, to praise thee, to give thanks unto thee, and to worship thee in every place of thy dominion. For thou art ineffable. In other words, there are no words to describe you. Inconceivable. We can't conceive of what you are. In invisible, incomprehensible. And so these are the apophatic way of uh, uh, describing. But then he goes into a positive description, ever existing and eternally the same. Thy, thou and thine only begotten the Son and thy Holy Spirit. And so just to, to be aware that uh, you know, if you're following in the service book uh, on page 112 in the red book, you'll see this prayer being said. And this is the kind of apophatic theology that we're talking about. So the timelessness of tradition contributes to orthodox theological unity because the sources are the same for all orthodox theologians throughout the world in every generation, time and again, now in the past and in the future. Regardless of our era or culture, we uh, read the same things we cite and ponder the same things as previous generations that read and discussed and cited these things as well. Even when more recent luminaries are recognized as fathers, such as St. John of Kronstadt, who died in 1909, who is a, a very influential and famous Russian Orthodox theologian, uh, he, they are read, cited, and acknowledged as fathers because they faithfully reflect the thought of earlier fathers and don't deviate from tradition. Okay. And so, and I'm sure Nina, you probably are, you know, know you're familiar with St. John of Kronstadt. Yes, I suspect that when I was in Sunday school, um, a late early 20s, we went um, to uh, the island of Kronstadt near St. Petersburg. We traveled in the dam mm -hmm. and was our Sunday school teacher. Uh, not his father, Constantine, he was a little bit of time. And we uh, did a Malayan, we prayed. Near his apartment. Right. With the second story of the balcony. Wow. Mm, how wonderful. And St. John Kronstadt is, he has a book called My Life in Christ about that day. And it has just so many insights into living the Orthodox life that all I can say is if you ever get a chance to read it, it is. It's just amazing. I, I recommended it when. Someone asked me, what, what can I read to learn about living the Orthodox spiritual life? Uh, that's one of the books I would recommend. So a very, uh, but, but the point I'm trying to make here is that here's a father who's in our 20th century, uh, who went, his, when you read him, you, you think you're reading, you know, St. Chrysostom and, and the apostles and et cetera. And then you, you look at, if you can read his, uh, his uh, scroll here, O oh, all merciful Lord, grant me the divine gift of holy prayer following from the depths of my heart. And this is just a, a, a capsulized uh, statement of what Orthodox phronema is. Mm -hmm. And so again, uh, right up to our time, we have he, this. He served in, in this, I believe it's called St. Nicholas Cathedral. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a Navy base on that island to the ships. And there's a ginormous cathedral, it's beautiful. Wow. Right on that island. Yeah. It's near St. Petersburg. It's near St. Petersburg. It's a cruise. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. Or the cruise ship stops at the island. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. <clears throat> Is that book in the bookstore, Charlie, or not? Uh, you know, I don't know, but I'm sure they could order it if, if we wanted to. We'll go to Amazon or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's readily available. Uh, but yeah, it's a meet your seal of approval. Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them Charlie sent you. It's trip recommended by Charlie. <laughs> this yeah, yeah. Do you get any revenue out of I this? Because you're retired now. You're looking yeah. for sources of passive to income. Make sure you make my name is Matt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That'll suffice. <laughs> so when the uh, writings of modern theologians are, are read and quoted, they don't really offer anything new or novel. Uh, they really just they express the Orthodox tradition uh, in a way that represents our present generation. So they speak to us because in our 
uh, times, uh, our culture may change, but the truth doesn't change, the tradition doesn't change, but maybe the way they express it related to our culture is, is such that they speak to us in our time. Uh, so the Orthodox practice of turning uh, primarily to scripture and the fathers automatically gives the theologian a, co a consistent orientation toward the early church. And so we constantly read the same things. And so over many hundreds of years by uh, practicing the liturgy, the sacraments, the feasts, and uh, the prayers, uh, that shapes the Orthodox throne of creates a consistent mindset. So that's why I go back and say, if you just look on the internet and say, oh, this is guy saying this and this, but you have to live the faith consistently throughout your life, and not just read about it, but attend the liturgies, uh, participate in the sacraments, the feasts, and things. That helps you develop the, the Orthodox phronom, the Orthodox mindset. Holiness of mind rather than uh, deductive reasoning. Uh, oftentimes, our Roman Catholic brothers use deductive reasoning to come to their conclusions. We've talked about this in the past. Uh, orthodoxy is holiness of mind. Now, what that means is that we don't use deductive reasoning to defend or explain the faith, and we don't attempt to resolve conflicts between faith and reason like some of the uh, Roman Catholic fathers did, particularly like uh, Thomas Aquinas. He spent years trying to you know, resolve faith and reason and proving that God exists, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the Orthodoxy doesn't really do that. We, we don't get into those kind of uh, discussions. Now, don't misunderstand. We don't reject the contribution of the human intellect and we don't reject science and education. The, unlike the Roman Catholics who went after Galileo because he decided, or he showed actually that the universe doesn't revolve around the earth, but it, the solar system revolves around the sun. Uh, if you go back and read St. Basil the Great, he talks about the science of his time and doesn't reject it. And so the Orthodox don't reject science. We don't reject, reject education but we don't use those as ways to define our faith. We use what we call holiness of mind, which is basically living the faith and practicing the faith and then allowing that faith to permeate our, our spiritual experience. And so the church fathers, when they argued against heresy, they didn't rely on deductive reasoning. They discussed the importance of the intellect, or what we call the noose, that part of our, <laughs> our soul that we talked about past. Hey, Charlie, the, the Nicene Creed versus the Apostles Creed, what, who made that? When was that change made? Not changed, but when did the Apostles Creed come? Is that a Protestant thing? That was probably early apostolic or maybe immediate post-apostolic period. I would say like St. Irenaeus of Lyon and some of the early church fathers who were disciples of the apostles. I think the apostolic creed developed at that point. So you're, you're uh, kind of not exact here. 200s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, between the one and 200s. Around that time, then some heresy started to come out like the Arian heresy uh, the son of God is created. He's not really God. So the Nicene Creed developed around 300, 325 okay. and was finalized in 381. And by that point, they defined the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and the church and what we believe. So what do the Catholics use? The, they use the Nicene, Nicene Creed. Creed. And what yeah. the Protestants use? The apostles? I don't know. Do you? I thought it was the Apostles' we, Creed. We did the Apostles' Creed. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. we used. Yeah. We did too. Okay. What's the difference? What is the Apostles' Creed? It's, I, it's very close, but yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. There's some nuances in there, but I didn't know if that was uh, came from the Catholic Church. But it sounds like no, it was before that. No, the the Nicene Creed was developed by the Universal Church at that time, which was East and West, and then the. Um, the uh, uh, 
unfortunately, the, the Roman Catholics added what they call the filioque, okay. which is defining the spirit as coming from the father, proceeding from the father and the son. Mm -hmm. That's the change that the Orthodox have not made. Okay. And that's to the Nicene Creed. That's correct. Okay. Got yeah. it. Thanks. So is there a there's a group of bishops that meet sometimes, like an overarching group? In I don't the, know if they're bishops here or, in the US. Is it is is Scoba US yeah. only? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. North America. Mm -hmm. So there's say. not a group that in, would encompass the patriarchs that meets ever? No, that would be an ecumenical council which they have been looking at trying to convene for, let's say maybe the last 50 years of all of the quote, <laughs> auto settlements. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a matter of trying to get these different groups together. And, and because of jurisdictional disagreements, they've not been able to get the autocephalous patriarchs of the mm -hmm. Orthodox Church together <clears throat> to meet in what we would call an ecumenical council. So like is Scoba, is Scoba actually still meet? Yeah. Once do they meet regularly? I think they meet regularly. I'm not exactly sure how often. But they don't come out with pronouncements necessarily about they come out with some things. Yeah. I think they do if there's a if there's a uh, question or a because there have been changes if you will sort of i mean they're not changes like the whole way we approach communion definitely changed from the seven before this in the 70s but i don't know who decided i think a, what happened was they were trying to uh, get people to take more frequent communion right uh, because there was a, a long-standing uh tradition uh small tea tradition that people only took communion if you were really bad you, know, you got to go to communion and if you didn't go to communion it was no big deal well that that all goes back to in in, in the older countries in the, in the back in the middle east and in places where there weren't priests available then communion wasn't available to be mm. to be distributed yeah, and i just that, wondered if there was any group that but yeah, it's it's and it, the name is different now. It's not it's called Scoba. I can't remember what it's know, called now, but it is the Metropolitans or the or the Archbishops of the Antiochian OCA, Greek, uh, Romanian, uh, Russian. Russian Patriarchate. Rom uh, I can't remember what uh, maybe it's Armenians. Armenian. Uh, Armenia or not? No. Not Armenian. Serbians Bulgarian. and uh, maybe Bulgarians. <laughs> But um, who, whoever is in the U.S. or in North America, I should say, they still meet on a regular basis. <coughs> so, I wonder if they serve baklava or baklava. <laughs> Depends on who's hosting. <laughs> who's the host? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, holiness of mind, other, rather than uh, deductive reasoning, uh, is not contrary to reason. Uh, reason is part of our God-given image. It's part of our uh, soul, uh, and that's what distinguishes us from from animals. Uh, you know, the animals uh, have uh, souls, or have a, 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 I should say, a animating force within them. Uh, but we have the uh, concept of reason. In fact, we're considered reason endowed beings, and that's how we're referred to uh, in in the church. Uh, reason can help put words. On the spiritual experience with uh, that we have with the divine, and in that sense, reason and holiness are not the opposite realities when applied uh, to uh, our experience. Our reason just helps basically put into words what we experience spiritually, uh, you know. And so, the human capacity for reason is to be distinguished from the application of deductive reasoning. Uh, it's part of the created order, and so. The created order is not, uh, it's different from the nature of God because he is above the created order. Over time, the preaching uh, of the uh, church was articulated and defined as dogma by the fathers of the church. But when they expressed the apostolic message, the fathers themselves theologized in the manner of the fishermen and not of Aristotle wrote, 
St. Gregory, the theologian, uh, who at that time he said, you know, we don't use uh, fancy philosophy. We basically go back to the manner of the fishermen, which is basically very simple preaching, which is what St. Paul preached, which was the crucified Messiah. And he said to the Corinthians and, and to all of us, the Jews ask for a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. What happened here was the Jews said, the Messiah can't be crucified. That's blasphemous. That just can't be. So that was a stumbling block for them. They, they couldn't get around that. And the Greeks said, a God that is crucified? How stupid, how foolish, how he cannot be. Our gods are, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these great, and they philosophized about this and all that. But St. Paul said, however, to those believers, to those who are being saved, the cross is salvation. Even if it's a stumbling block to the Jews and <clears throat> Uh, foolishness to the Greeks. And in fact, if you go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, St. Paul even talks about it further. He says that the foolishness of the world God has made uh, as, as nothing but the, but the uh, foolishness of the cross, he, sorry, the wisdom of the world he has made foolish, but the foolishness of the cross he has made salvation <clears throat> from. So and that kind of discussion is uh, what we continue to embrace as Orthodox in our uh, from in our mentality. It's, it's kind of that thinking that where people tend to, I think, just overanalyze so much or just overthink it and then just miss the mark because they're spending so much time on that. Mm -hmm. So a guy that was in business with me, we used to say to him, we said it was paralysis by analysis. He would just analyze everything. It, it just drove it crazy. It's like, why don't you just make a decision? Yeah. You know, believe in something and make a decision because you're going to drive yourself crazy and everybody else around you, right? Yeah, exactly. and, and it did. Right? Right. To the point of like he just laughed because it just didn't work. Yeah, but I, th I think as Christians we have to stop over analyzing everything and just believe, just live it. Now, yeah. again, that's something that's a challenge for me, uh, but it's a challenge obviously for a lot of other people. You try to justify it, but then you start justifying it. Then you're saying, well, then why can't it make it a little bit more like what I want it to be? Yes. Right? Yes. And that's the option. And you twist it. it and yeah. well, I think it means this. Well, it may mean that for you because that's maybe intentional because you want it to kind of go down your path, right? And that's what we exactly try to avoid in orthodoxy is that each one's interpretation is their, is their own. Right understanding and then our understanding is my understanding is different than yours and we can never come to a common conclusion because we're like you said we're constantly over analyzing it to the point where you can't make a conclusion but saint paul said christ crucified but what that means is that he was crucified he died and he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and that's where we that's it's foolishness to the greeks it's a stumbling block to the jews but to us, we understand that without the crucifixion, there is no resurrection mm -hmm. and ascension and eternal life. And so that's, you can say, we have to, you know, take, simply take what Christ did for us and believe it and live it. Mm -hmm. and go Which is interesting. You look at our church with all the icons around, you know, it's telling that, that picture. When you go into the Jewish temple, they, they don't have icons do they? What, what's yeah. on there? They, they're missing like half of our, well, more than half of the icons. What they may have are some Old Testament uh, passages in Hebrew written in different places, which is fine. I mean, we, we no. actually, you know, the Old Testament is ours. The Old Testament is mm -hmm. now Christian, but that's where they stop. Oh. They cannot go past that's that. Right, yeah. See? So that's why it's a stumbling block for them. Because Christ crucified, they can't accept that. That's not their understanding of the Messiah. So they would walk into like our church and look at the icons and have no idea what's going on. Right. Or they don't accept it. Yeah. Or even, for instance, 
Today is the uh, the feast day of Saint Barbara. Okay, the great martyr. Barbara. Barbara. Yes. Yeah, Gregory, Barbara. <laughs> we're cloud of witnesses. John, we're going to get you pretty soon. <laughs> My saint name is Nicholas. So. Oh, oh there yeah. you go. Okay. Happy name, yeah. Sure. Give me a couple minutes. <laughs> and so there with that. Good. Yeah. Saint Barbara was uh, some, some of her parents were pagan, and you know they would not accept that she became a Christian. And in fact, her own father, you know, killed her. But the point is uh, that type of thing. You know, Saint Barbara is there with all the other cloud of witnesses, uh, and to to anyone else, they would think, you know, how what do you what do you have? You know, people who were killed on your wall. You know, that's so foolish. But to us, we understand that her faith was such that she was ready to give up her life. Uh, and even from you know, her own parents would not accept mm -hmm. that. Uh, but we do. We accept that she accepted eternal life rather than the life um, in the temporal world. I was at a, a baptism last week. And all the little kids you know, are there you know, with the kids that are getting the children that were being baptized. But if you watch these kids come in and maybe haven't seen it before, and they're just in awe. They're looking up like this at these icons, and they're going, you know, it's it's amazing. And in the Protestant church, we didn't have that. We, maybe there's a cross or a stained glass window. Um, Good point, Rob. Looking up, we look toward heaven. We don't look earthwise. We look heavenward. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's there's a reason for that. Yeah. And you just you brought up a very good point that our church is ascent, is ascends, which is our next oh. <laughs> ascent of mind. Our minds ascend to God. And so orthodoxy, are we getting close time? Oh, boy. Okay. Well, we'll go through this real quick. Uh, ascent of mind, our, our whole theology is uplifting. We, we, our, our words, our everything is uplifting. It goes up to... It's called on a basis, which means an upward movement or of a gradual understanding. Let us basis. lift our hearts up unto, unto the, the Lord. Lord. Yeah. Exactly. And so the theological insight. And the other thing is this is open to all clergy, laity, monastics, uh, men and women, highly educated and uneducated. This isn't a high uh, intensity mm -hmm. philosophy where only, you know, eggheads can understand it. This is for anyone mm -hmm. who opens their heart to God and Christ, they will ascend to that. We preserve the faith. We don't develop doctrine. Uh, again, we don't do explanations and definitions as a rule. And uh, we preserve tradition. Orthodoxy has authority. Is Our tradition is our authority. Uh, it's not what we believe uh, as far as our interpretation of the Bible on our own. It's what our church uh, relies on authority itself, and it's not just in Rome. Uh, these next few uh, slides I want to just go through, they're not really uh, germane, but tradition involves, and I want to make this point real quick, tradition has scripture, canons, fathers, councils, an entire way of life. So tradition with a capital T is our <clears throat> is our, and this is what St. Paul says. So brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. And so remember, the preaching came before the New Testament scripture. And so that's where it was founded. Uh, sin and salvation and legalism. Uh, we, we think of sin as an illness. And so what we do is we describe Christ, and you'll hear it in the when we bow our heads unto the Lord, at the end of that prayer, he says, Thou who art the physician of our souls and bodies. So when we sin, we come to the hospital to get healed. And that's what our whole mentality about sin is not a legalistic thing. It's uh, heal our souls. And the last thing I want to talk about real quickly here is Lord have mercy. When people come to our church, why do you say Lord have mercy so many times? What do you, and we're not, we're not throwing ourselves on the mercy of the court like a, like a condemned mm -hmm. criminal would say, oh, please have mercy. I mean, no, what we're asking is for healing. Lord have mercy means healing. And it's in the biblical tradition because in Christ, 
healing ministry, when people came to him, they said, like the two blind men, son of David, have mercy on us. Or the Canaanite woman, uh, have mercy on me, Lord, uh, because for her, on behalf of her daughter and the, uh, the man whose son was uh, dying, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's asking for healing. And that's what we would say, Lord, have mercy. And, the, and if you hear the great doxology, one of the petitions is, I said, have mercy upon me, O Lord, heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. And so when we say mercy, we mean healing. Mm -hmm. You're going to the doctor. And so the final uh, slide today, uh, Orthodox Christianity is faithful to tradition maintained, uh, maintaining the biblical patristic understanding of sin and salvation as Christ is, came to heal and sanctify the effects by his incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection. So this is the Orthodox Phronema. Next week, we're going to talk about how do you acquire it, how we acquire Orthodox Phronema. Mm -hmm. Chapter 5 in the book. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Questions, comments? Thank, thank you, everyone, for being Great here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Saint Robert. Yeah. No, I don't think we have a Saint Robert. I didn't know we had a Saint Robert. Yeah.